Um, and today it's my parents' wedding anniversary, 37 years, right? And uh, that's what, um, partly why I'm here on the earth. So that's some serious relational connecting going on. <laughs> Not to embarrass them, but anyway. Um, <laughs> um, it's so important that um, we don't live and be ruled by the religious spirit because it is so stuffy <laughs> and confining and um, Christ is so not <laughs> and his life is so spacious. It's unbelievable. Um, I'm going to use a whiteboard maybe. I don't know. At first I was, I was thinking about it, but um, I just want to write these words that I heard so clearly. Oh, excuse my handwriting. Please spell right. Our beginning. <laughs> Cheeky. All right. Jesus, the light of all men, our beginning and our end. A few weeks ago, I was um, in Melbourne and uh, we were um, visiting partly. Um, some friends that are uh, really good family friends, and um, this man is in, um, I think he's in his 60s, and uh, he was just sharing about an encounter that he had with the religious system as a young boy, and why he was sharing this is because he knew, I guess, where um, my relationship is with the Lord, and uh, my mum's probably as well. Um, and so what he was wanting to share was, pretty, without saying it, was the why. Why he has the view he does of the Lord. Which the view, sadly, is limited to this encounter he had with the, the religious system. And so he, he shares about um, how the, the minister and his two elders had... Um, part of this religious ceremony of confirming them, would um, ask these boys, which was a few of them, a few of them were his friends, um, and what they would have to do is one by one come into this room with the minister and the elders and um, have a conversation. And the question that is asked is, have you seen the light? Have you seen the light? He's 10 years old, I think, at the time. And one by one, the boys, um, to relieve probably the, the, the pressure of their parents, would say yes on rote. Yes. I've seen the light. Yes. But he said no. And he wasn't branded, dedicated. And while he was speaking to me, my heart... <laughs> It just, it's, it's saddened, but at the same time, I was, I was thinking just yesterday, I kind of wish I was it, was, it was me in that line, and as a cheeky 10-year-old, if someone said, have you seen the light, and knowing that I haven't quite understood the question or understood what they're actually saying, I could be like, no, have you seen the light? <laughs> because in Psalm 36, 9, it says, in your light, in Christ's light, we see light. So if the Christ is the light of all men, is in you, then I would see light. And no, I don't see light. Ladies and gentlemen, this is true for us today. We have to know light to be light. And that only comes through relational connection, not religious ceremony. said he wasn't confirmed, he wasn't branded confirmed. You know what branding makes me think of? It makes me think of farm animals that go on the conveyor belt with a hot fire stick into the flesh. I remember when the Lord came, he didn't pierce only my flesh, my soul, but my heart. He circumcised the heart. And it, 
they say the change of heart changes everything. It absolutely does. My eyes were opened to a new reality, the only true reality that exists, that now that I had seen the lights, I could see the Lord, I could hear the Lord, I could understand his ways. It brought me into this relationship and life of Christ. And this is daily life, not on a, a great Sunday service. It was every day my life was changing and being directed by the Lord. No longer was I in darkness, stumbling around through life, looking for meaning and fulfillment or freedom. The, the dark and disillusioned life was over because I found true life through a deep, intimate, relational connection with the Lord, the living God. The day I was born again, I remember looking in the mirror and my face had changed. My face had changed, my life had changed. And in John it says, those who receive him, he gave them, listen to this, the right to become children of God. They didn't need to be confirmed with a, fight, fight, with a hot, fiery stick. If we believe him in our hearts, it says that he gives us the right to be sons of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born, not of blood, not, nor of the will of man, but of God. See, new birth does not come from physical descent. It doesn't come from human effort or human violation, but by the power of God. The power of God. The day Jesus was born, it was the beginning point of change. Absolute change. The face of the earth changed. People's lives changed as they once knew it. Romans 10 says, for with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. So, can I blame this friend for having a dark understanding of God that is limited and as small as that stuffy, dim room that he was called into? Can I blame him? No. No, I can't. Entrance into the kingdom is by righteousness of heart, not by hypocritical or external legalism. Righteousness of heart is only possible through the Messiah's reign in our hearts. And, you know, I know the festive season, it, it can be sometimes, uh, and probably for a lot of people, um, one of confusion, chaos, and void of substance. Even if we are Christians, I've, I've been processing this in the last oof, few months. Christmas, what, what do we do about it? What, what is it? What? And it, it can be a, a confusing um, idea. And it always amazes me how the lead up to Christmas is such excitement and anticipation and the pressure and all this surmounts and we get advent, advent calendars that come out and uh, it's this great excitement which is awesome. But I want to focus today on the greatest countdown of history, mm. that generations and generations and generations, the prophets, the faithful forerunners were all waiting for this event, the birth of Christ. There's so much surrounding what was happening that seriously, I, I was hours sitting there just going, okay, I need to kill this, I need to kill that. I can't, I could go anywhere with this, but the Lord was like, Jesus is the light of all men, stick to the light. So that's what I'm gonna do. I wanna um, clarify and bring order, not necessarily to Christmas Day, a once-off event, but on the birth of Christ that connected us to him and marked our hearts and people's hearts forevermore. And we just cannot afford today or any other day to view his birth to the constraints of Christmas Day and the rote of yearly tradition on the 25th of December. We just cannot afford to bring it down to this because it's so much more than that. So let's go back to the beginning, and I want to bathe this message of Christ's birth in the true light of who he is. 
The events of his birth reveals the truth of God to us. Listen to this, so that we can live in reality and not illusion. This chaos is illusion. People spending money, having to take loans out to, it's crazy. It's illusional and it's not reality that, that Christ came for. So today, in the light of who he is, I, I, I want to bring light to, to the birth. So let's go back to Genesis 1. It says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. Now, light is quite an interesting word. And if we look into the, the pictograph of what the word light means, we get a picture of an ox and a man's head. And what this means is that light is the, is the strength from above. And it means to be led from the top. Interesting. And the more it unpacks about light, it talks about light being a mechanism that brings order out of chaos. And we can think of it like boxes. When we clear up our house and we need to transfer our belongings to another space, we put things in boxes. This is what light does. It takes, it takes um, it's the mechanism that takes the ideas and the thoughts in our heads of like what we want it to look like, put it in the box and we transfer it. And this is what light does, the strength from above. Bending over, putting things in the box, the strength from above. Does this make sense? Leading from the top. What that does is it brings order and it organizes chaos into order so that there is functionality and harmony. Beautiful. So in the beginning, we get the picture of the Lord as strength from above, starting to bring form and order to his creation. But in order to do this, he uses light. When we want to clean a messy room, we've got to have the light on so we can see, right? It also talks about this light, that it, it is the strength that affects and energizes all things. The person of Christ, when he came, he affected all things, and he energizes all things. It's amazing. So in Genesis, we see that the light is a mechanism in transferring the order that exists within the Father into creation, his intentions being reflected in his work. The story goes on, so we know in the beginning this is what happened. And then there was the fall, and then we see creation falling. And Paul describes it later on, that man has lost the, the pure and simple devotion to Christ. And in, in this festive season, I feel it can easily be done that we lose the pure and simple devotion we have in our hearts for the Lord, the relational connection for something else. We see humanity, void of righteousness, begins its own effort to become like gods, power hungry, making idols in their own image and worshipping them, partaking in religious ceremonies of sacrifice, practicing their own made-up rules, and setting up traditions that burden other people. It's a true state of chaos. Though through this we have the prophets, go love the prophets, who are always encouraging man and people to connect back to God, to connect and know that he is a God who is personal and who wants to draw near. And a God that will save them from their own lives and their own brokenness. And one prophet in particular in Malachi said, But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go out and you will leap like calves, released from the stall. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Freedom! 
This is what happens. This is the effect of righteous men, men who have seen the light. They now are able, in their humility, who, humility comes from the reverence of the Lord. We now see righteous men like the prophets and like others in the word. They are able to open the door to reveal to others the light. It's, it's so beautiful. And this relational connection with God by faith. I love what Sam said the other day. All, this is all he said. He said, by faith, we understand. And there's more to the verse. But I, my heart burns. Like, you know that burning sensation? Because I, I heard that. I go, yes, by faith, we understand. We understand complex things that we could read in the word that we think are contradictory, but by faith we understand. It's a simple and pure devotion of the Lord, of that relational connection simplifies all things. So when we, when we live by faith, we know the will of God, and we live to prove it. And I want to share about what was surrounding around Christ's birth, how these people um, were proving the will of God. They were fulfilling prophecies um, all through the relational connection they had with him. So in, in the time of turmoil, there was also a prophet called Jeremiah. And by this stage, King David, the righteous king, was promised um, that the future, would, the future Messiah would be from his throne would come from his lineage. And this king would reign with righteousness and peace and bring harmony. And yet king after king through the royal line of David, for for most, they bring destruction. Corrupt leadership. Kingdoms ruling with darkness. And king after king, we come to King... Jokaniah. Probably haven't said his name right, but let's just go with Jokaniah today. <laughs> and what's interesting about this King Jokaniah is that in Jeremiah, it talks about how he was against the Lord, but he actually set himself against the prophet Jeremiah. And everything Jeremiah was saying, bringing warning to the people. And Jeremiah, to a point where the Lord has had enough, Jeremiah prophesies this Land, land, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, write this man down childless, a man who will not prosper in his days, for no man of his descendants will will prosper sitting on the throne of David or ruling again in Judah. So we have a prophecy that Jesus, the Messiah, has to come from the royal line of David. Now we have this curse. What, what now? <laughs> what now? And so it goes on, and we know that um, the empire Babylon comes and actually takes King Jokaniah captive. And this is the last we hear of um, a king coming from this line. And the descendants, we can look at in Matthew 1, the lineage of Christ, the descendants from Jokaniah, every person named after that was not a king. There was one Zebubabel who was, <laughs> don't judge me people, <laughs> um, who was a governor, not a king, but a governor. And there's more in that. Um, and so we see these generations living for themselves, power hungry, ruling with their own greediness, burdening the people, and indulging in whatever they wanted. The generation, cumulative sin, had run the nation of Israel into the ground and all other principalities we see are rising. And the house of David, the lineage, gets lost. Gets lost. Then we hear about this little place that's quite obscure called Nazareth. And we hear about a man who was a carpenter, living his daily life, 
the, Lord, the, the word says that he was a righteous man. I remember Nathaniel asks, what good comes from Nazareth? We're about to hear what good comes from it. Like I said, in Matthew 1, if we read Joseph's lineage, and we, we read up towards David, we see King Jokaniah there. And we realize that Joseph has come from this curse. It's interesting to me that Joseph is living this life when above the daily life and the daily grind, in the spiritual realm, he, he is actually supposed to be a king sitting on his throne, rightfully so. <laughs> rightfully so. But we need to remember this, the kingdom is not about being right or wrong, it's about righteousness. And in order to fulfill righteousness, this is, this is what it was looking like, Joseph as a carpenter in daily life. King Joke and I was branded a king, and the title was skin deep, but did not have the circumcised heart of a king. And so this revelation raises a big question that, can de that determines everything, really, if we think about it. For the prophecies to be fulfilled of the coming Messiah, the righteous king, he must be of the royal line of David. Yet another prophecy is that no descendant of David will sit on the throne. Joseph is under this curse. What is the will, the will of God here in these conflicting prophecies? How can the promised birth of the righteous king happen? There's only one way, and that's the virgin birth. Mary, too, is a descendant of King David, but through the bloodline. The virgin birth would mean that the curse over jo Joseph's royal lineage would not be infected. And it would not interfere with the birth of the Messiah and his reign, but will actually fulfill the word of God perfectly. Isn't that amazing? The virgin birth in Luke Remember, the angel explains to Mary that the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Sorry, will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Can we hear that strength from above? The Spirit will come upon you. And it gives us a, black, a glimpse back to the beginning in Genesis where the same Spirit that was hovering over that formless, void creation, before God said, let there be lights, is the same spirit who conceived the light of all men in Mary. Hovering speaks of moving rather than staying stationary. The Holy Spirit, as we can see and almost picture, is the executive arm of the Trinity. And as the Lord is speaking, the Spirit is making it happen. And that's for us today. As the Lord is speaking, as he has given us words, the Spirit is active. He is not stationary. He is hovering. He is upon us, making things happen that we would fulfill the Lord, fulfill the will of the Lord. Again, if we look in Genesis and God's first divine command, it begins with the process of transforming chaos into order. And he uses light. So beautifully, over the next few days, we hear how creation takes form, order, and we see how beauty emerges from, from what the Lord is doing. And so is the same with the conception and birth of light. He comes to his creation to bring life, to bring order and beauty to their lives and to our lives. Only the strength from above who is led from the top could save us. The righteous king and kingdom are now here. When that birth happened, it meant that the kingdom and the king were now near. 
And this is why John the Baptist, his message was so urgent. So urgent. And why he came before Christ with the, the message of change your heart, change your mind. Because a change of heart changes everything. And the Lord is coming. See, the nearness of God's reign would confront people with an inescapable decision. This is what the light does. The effect of Jesus' ministry as the light of all men enlightened the human conscience and thereby makes mankind responsible to God. That's what it says in Romans. This is the effect of light. It enlightens the human conscience where we now see and now we are accountable and responsible for what we know. So what do we do with what we know? Do you see the light? I think Jesus would say, do you know the light? In John 8, it says, Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world, and he who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Hallelujah. The light in this verse is directly linked to the light in the beginning in Genesis. And if we today are in darkness, or if we feel like our life is in chaos, and far from God, I want to tell us today, it's not too late. It's never too late. If we go back to King David, who the Lord said is a man after my own heart. In Psalm 51, he, he, he's crying out to the Lord because he's just been found out that he slept with another man's wife. Man after God's own heart. And I'll tell you why. It's because he cries out. And and I love how the message put it. It said, God, make a fresh start in me. Create in me a new heart. (laughs) Listen to this. Shape a Genesis week from the chaos of my life. (sighs) A new heart brings a new beginning. And that light that, that started in Genesis will come and bring order out of your chaos, will bring light to your darkness, as it has for me. John the Baptist, the father, um, John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, with great joy, had prophesied that the birth of Christ, he said this, I love it, I could not stop reading it, he said, the day spring on high has come to visit us, the day spring on high has come to visit us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. A few years ago, um, someone was coming along to the rock. Um, They had been part of the family for probably about six months, and and our relationship was growing, and um, I was helping them settle in um, into a new country. And um, after the the festive season, after Christmas Day, I, I didn't see her again. And I thought, right, I'll just give her a call and just check in, see how she's going. I was stunned by the phone call I just had. She was very upset that on the 25th of December, the day we had the service, we did not share on the traditional Christmas message. And because of this, she had decided she was not coming back and she was cutting off relational connection with any of us who were at the rock. Now, there's a lot I can say about the 25th of December, but it's not about being right or wrong. It's about righteousness. It's not about what I know. Again, it's about who we know. See, when the wise men came to Jerusalem during the time where King Herod had just found out that this, the birth of Christ, of, uh, it says, the wise men came to Jerusalem asking, where is the true king that's being born? Imagine King Herod hearing this as king of the time, right? And so he, he's starting to get all funny about it. And so what he does is he, he gathers all the scribes and the religious people, the chief priests, and he says to them, guys, tell me, where is this, king, this true king going to be born? And what these guys do is they, they refer to the prophecy in Micah 5.2, I think it is. 
And they say, the prophecy says he's going to be born in Bethlehem. So what's interesting to me is instead of these scribes and these religious men and the chief priests who have made their whole studying and learning about the coming Messiah, chooses not to pilgrimage with the wise men to go see if it's true. (laughs) See, this is the difference between knowing the word and knowing the living word. We have to take the journey. So back to the conversation I was having with this person. I felt sadness and compassion by what I was hearing. I offered and said, please, can we just sit down, just hear from one another, just to get some understanding? Can we journey this out together? And at the end of the day, it was a flat out no. And I think I was stunned by the hypocrisy of my relational connection with this person being traded in for a traditional ceremony, which is about relational connection. That's sad. You know, Bethlehem every year is a point of um, pilgrimage. Thousands and thousands of people go there every year. But let's not be like those scholars and those priests who miss that first pilgrimage to see for themselves if this is the king. I want to encourage us all to go on the journey, to see things for ourselves, not always just take reference to what we, we hear or what opinions are weightless without experience. Absolutely weightless. See, this person believed by keeping the religious ceremony, being bound to the date of the 25th of December, being possessive with the message, it was their way of securing their personal righteousness. But we cannot be precious about the 25th of December as the birth date of Christ. Not for the reasons, like I said, of being right or wrong, but it's about fulfilling righteousness. I talked about Christ as the light, and now I want to talk to him talk about him as the lamb. Nisan 1. This is uh, the first month of the year in the Hebrew calendar. And <clears throat> Nisan falls in springtime. It's the astral sign of Nisan is the lamb. Why is this significant? Well, we know that the wise men who journeyed to see the birth were reading the star signs, Right? not like astrology as we know it, but it shows us how the events of Christ's birth um, had cosmic significance. Because remember, it's not like he was just born this day. He was, born, he was in the beginning. All creation was, was made through him. And so, of course, creation's response to the word becoming the living word, the word becoming flesh, there's a response in creation. There's the cosmic significance of what was happening. It's astounding. That's the countdown right there. And it still is today for the second coming. There's a tangent. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into, be- into being that has come into being. <laughs> so my point, Nisan means the beginning. I believe Jesus was from the beginning and was born, made incarnate with the beginning of a new kingdom and a new life for his creation. Nisan falls in spring. Springtime is about new beginnings, new life, and new order organic order. The astral sign is the ram, which is the lamb. In the word, it says that around the birth was the shepherds were out at night with their flocks. Shepherds would not be out at night, usually, unless it was lambing season. Lambing season falls in spring. Lambs are only born One time in the year, and that's springtime. Isn't that interesting? 
So what were these shepherds doing? They were out with their flock, watching for their flock to bring the, to bring the lambs. And then the angel comes to them. And they have no idea that they're about to meet the Lamb of God. And so what better way for the, the Lamb of God to be greeted by the shepherds? Bethlehem, the place of his birth, is where the lambs were born that would finally become the temple sacrifices. Interesting, for people's sin. John 1 says that Jesus became flesh to dwell with us. And it's such a beautiful reminder that for God to identify with humanity binds himself through the conception and birth of, of himself, through, through Mary. I love that the Lord identified with us. Do you know when the priests would make the sacrifice, they would put their hands on the sacrifice. The laying of hands is, is actually a sign of identifying with, with the sacrifice. So again, today I want us to hear through the relational connection of a personal God who draws near, who identifies with us to every point, that when, when we are with another person out of a love relationship, out of connection, laying hands isn't just a, like a transferring of power, which I'm sure it can be as well, but it's connecting with the person and going, I identify with you. I identify with your hurt. I identify with your pain. And I'm going to sit here with you. And together we're going, to, we're going to ask for the light to come. And we're going to move from darkness to light. We're going to together bring order from chaos. The laying of hands for us as believers is so important. But it, it has to come from the relational aspect. Not the religious Lay your hands, that's what the elders do. That is what they do. And I know our elders, it's to identify with the people. Beautiful. Righteousness can be defined as the condition of being accepta acceptable to God, but also as made possible by God. Unless God is its author, we will never possess it. This is the essence of Christ's birth, a miraculous phenomenon that only by the initiation and the hand of God could, could have been possible. As we heard through that lineage, it was looking impossible. Circumstances were not looking good for Joseph. It was not looking good for the promised Messiah to come from the line of David. But in God, all things are possible. And the righteousness of heart, it, it means that we are under a new kingdom, governments, We've seen in the last year, all sorts of things are happening from the US. People have ideas about New Zealand. Listen, guys, if we're getting upset and we're getting personal and being horrific about our, our prime minister because we're offended by who's in government, whose government are you under? We're under the king who is above every government. That's where we live from. We live in in relational connection with the true governing king who came and made himself flesh to live in us, that we would be the light, the light of all men. We, I had to go through this process with self-righteousness and Trump. What? Who? Who would do that? Not you, Lord. And he was like, Melissa, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Was it you pulling the waves back from the sea? Was it, have you ever in the morning woken up and commanded the sun to shine? That's what he said to me. Can you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, that's a self-righteous thing. I'm going to end with this. Because this is the picture I keep seeing. Can we see that? Can you, can you guys see? N not really. Um, Jesus, the light of all men, beginning and end. There is no end, eternity. He, he rules with no end. His earthly life, generations and generations and generations of people 
either fulfilling the righteousness of God because of relational connection or not realizing that they're fulfilling the will of God through their own self-righteousness. A picture of this Sam gave beautifully the other week when, when the soldiers were scrambling for the garments at, at the bottom. I was totally unaware that they're actually fulfilling the very prophecy that said when, the G, when Jesus would die, that these soldiers would come and try to divide his garments. Fulfilling the prophecy of God, the will of God, unintentionally, but also in a religious way. We can do that, guys. We can do that. If we're not in relational connection with the God of all things, we can land up doing that. This is the picture of generation on generation, and there's Mel's life. See that? That little blip? That's my life. Now, I can either live with self-righteousness and live between the parameters of my own understanding and thinking, from my own little experiences I've learned in a whole 33 years of life. So, of course, when I'm, when I'm challenging the Lord Almighty who put, put creation into order, and I'm going, why would you do that? He's like, where were you here? What do you know here? Oh, but... I know things. No, you don't. You can know all things. By faith, we understand. But that will change your heart. And you're not going to judge from what you see and what you hear in the physical. But you're going to judge righteously by how the Lord sees. So pray for our government. <laughs> the government, global governance. Thank you. Because we're not of that government, of physical government, we're from his government. Jesus, the light of all men, is always willing to give us a clean heart, always ready to give us a Genesis shaped week to bring order and perfect harmony with him. The righteous life is on offer, where we are not only in his acceptable condition, but have access into the heart and mind and the ways of God. He has predestined us to live and do righteous works and deeds according to his will. He is the day spring from on high, the strength from above who is led from the top, who is gifted to us from the heavens and who will lead us into everlasting life, starting today and every other day. It's springtime for us, guys. Every day is a new beginning with the Lord. Hallelujah. Our portion is not the garments that are shed at the foot of, cross, of the cross, dis disillusioned by what we see in the physical, but the true reality that Christ born is our salvation. This festive season, I pray that as believers of the true King, with humility and in awe of who he is, we will open the door for others to see the light, the sun on the horizon, the son of righteousness who will come with a new day, new dawn, a new kingdom for his new creation. Cool. <laughs> I'm sorry, I hope that wasn't too much, but um, um, I'm just going to pray and, um, yeah, thank the Lord for just for who he is. Father, I just thank you for this body and for those who couldn't be with us today who are with uh, their families and with significant other people in their lives and enjoying this time with them. I thank you for that. And Lord, um, you just are so worthy of our lives, Lord. And I thank you for your life that it has come and has made me new and has made us new. I thank you that you are a God of order and harmony and you, you long for us to live in this righteous, right relationship with you, where we can come to know all things that are according to your will, that gives us confidence to live out our lives day by day. I thank you that it's always springtime with you, Lord. I thank you that you give us new beginnings. I thank you that you never give up on us. You are faithful even when we are not. I thank you that you make a way for all those who love you. You make all things good for those who love you. 
I thank you that no, it doesn't matter where we come from, our past, it doesn't matter what family we've grown up in, if it's been, um, if it has been harder, uh, more than what others might have experienced, Lord, it, we are not from a physical descent, from a physical lineage, Lord. You say that when we believe in our hearts, we become, we have the right to be your children, not through a bloodline. So Lord, those things, they're all under your rule. And I thank you for your kingdom that you rule with righteousness. So today I just pray, Lord, that the Spirit has broken out any mindsets that are, are constrained to Christmas Day as, it's, as a once-off thing. But we would hear the relational connection of what your birth has, has done and the effect of it still today and forevermore. That we are amongst generations and generations and generations of people who laid their life down to prove the will of God. We bless you and we love you, Lord. I love you with everything. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys.